Hello and welcome to day two of OFM Online. Whether you're an on fire mission regular or joining us for the first time, it's great to have you with us as we explore together what it means to be sacramental and spirit filled at this time. Today we're going to be focusing on the question, what does a charismatic spirituality look like in isolation? To help us reflect on that, we'll begin with a brief reflection from Debbie Orris on what spiritual gifts look like in the age of social distancing. Then we'll join Rob Sutherland and Eddie Green for a conversation about sign and spirit. And we'll round off by worshipping together, led by On Fire Mission's very own Director of Music, Liam Cartwright. As we gather today, together but apart, do be open and attentive to what the Spirit might be saying to you, to us as a community, to the wider church. Just be aware of any promptings, any pictures or words, and whether those might be things you want to share with someone else. And keep the conversation going, online on social media, using hashtag OFM online and hashtag sacramental spirit filled, and join us afterwards in the Zoom bar to continue the discussion. What do spiritual gifts look like in an age of social distancing? Well, I would say that they look the same as they ever have. As Paul describes in his first letter to the Corinthians, they vary but come from the same Lord. They're given for the common good. They're allotted to each one of us as the Spirit chooses, and without love they're worthless. In terms of their variety, the spiritual gifts are listed at the beginning of that letter from Paul as wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, discernment of spirits, prophecy, various kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Boy, do we need those in abundance in these days. We need spiritual wisdom and knowledge as we try and work out what God is doing so that we can join in, both individually as members of the scattered church and as we seek to enable the church to gather, albeit virtually, through the various online platforms as well as using the phone. The spiritual gifts are given for the common good. They're gifts to be shared, used for the blessing of others in our families, in our communities, in our friendship groups. In and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are called to be conduits of healing and miracles through our prayers and through our neighbourly actions with and for others. We are called to speak God's word into the injustices that are becoming increasingly apparent in relation to how those who are the most marginalised are suffering to the greatest extent the impact of the, the pandemic. And we may find that our faith is being tested in ways that we've never experienced before, and so an increase in the gift of faith is needed for these days. As our faith is increased, we are more able to effectively share good news with those that we are called to bless in the name of Jesus. The spiritual gifts are given as the Spirit chooses, and I believe that God is calling some of us to accept gifts that are perhaps new to us in these days. For example, I'm sure there are times when many of us are struggling to know what to pray, how to pray, and God may be wanting us to receive the gift of tongues so that we can pray more effectively in accordance with God's will. Some of us may have received this gift in the past but have perhaps neglected it. The final characteristic of the spiritual gifts is love. Without love, they're worthless. The gifts come from God who is love and demonstrates God's love for God's world. Without love, they're simply empty ritual expressions of our spiritual ego. 
I believe that God is calling each of us into a deeper love relationship with Jesus. The more we open ourselves up to that love, the more we can share it with others. As we may have heard many times, you can't share what you don't have. If we desire to draw closer to Jesus, resting in God's presence, opening ourselves up to the Spirit, whether that be on our daily walk or sitting quietly in a prayer space at home, God will meet us. And if we ask for the gifts God wants to give us, I have no doubt that we will receive in order to share those gifts with others. And if, if all this sounds too much, if you're just struggling to get through each day at the moment, if all you can offer right now are tears and sighs as your prayers, be encouraged. God will receive them and answer them. Paul's letter to the Romans speaks of the Spirit helping us in our weakness. Romans 8 verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. reflection on Psalm 139. We're going to look just at verses 7 to 12. As we go through this, we're not going to think about any sort of um, context of it at the time, but I want you to just hear these words uh, in your own context, where you are with what's going on in your life at the moment. So I'm going to read through the passage a couple of times and then I'll just give you a few questions to, to reflect on. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. What word or phrase caught your attention in that passage? Don't try to analyse or explain it at this point, just, just hold on to it. Whether it's a single word or a sentence, an image, just hold it in your mind's eye. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Thinking of that word or phrase that's stuck in your mind, start to think now about why 
those words are speaking to you here and now? What do they mean to you? What are the, the rough edges in your life that have snagged on those words? What are the hopes or the fears or the hidden desires that it's spoken to? Take a moment to just consider what is being said to you there. Whatever you feel is being said to you in those verses, whatever you think God might be speaking to you, take a moment to just respond in prayer. Maybe there's words that you can put that into. Maybe you can't put it into words at the moment. But there's just something to set before God and ask him to make of what he will. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Bringing all of that that you have brought before God, just take a moment to ask what is it that God is calling you to do? What is it that God is asking of you? Where might God be leading you next? I hope that you have heard God speaking to you in those words of the psalm. And wherever you are and whatever you're doing, whatever God might be calling you to, I pray his blessing on you. Amen.
Rob, so good to see you. It is fantastic How to see you, you as well, Eddie. <laughs> it, it's great to be together here at um, Not On Fire. Well, it's like like Not Greenbelt that happens every year for those who can't go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what you can do through the power of technology. When it works. When, yeah, when it works. Um, when it's not being done just for fun, but instead for something serious. Yeah. That's yeah. why we're giggling so much whilst we do this, because it's for something serious. It's it's fine when you're playing around with something on the edges, but as soon as you rely on it every day, um, yeah. I think we're here to talk about charismatic spirituality, is that right? Charismatic spirituality and um, being in lockdown, being stuck on your own, I think is what we I'm sure Leah gave us a better title than that, but that is what it is essentially, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's what does it mean to be a charismatic whilst we're stuck in our own houses? Um, and, which... and that's a really interesting thing to, to, to start with because um, I don't know about you I mean I've got a reputation as an extrovert a reputation as an extrovert I think on the Myers-Briggs scale they put me off the edge I was literally 100% extrovert when it uh, when it was done which Sh is uh, strange really um, given that I'm now finding myself stuck in the house on my own. Yeah, and, and being an extrovert is interesting because um, I think people have misconceptions about how extroverts works, what extroversion works. I mean, I, I love being around people and uh, spirituality, which involves other people, um, but I really do value time on my own mm. as well. It's interesting when I think about how my extroversion works when it comes to finding places where I can engage as an individual, um, Durham Cathedral has a um, side chapel with the uh, Blessed Sacrament in it. And that is the place where I find myself most connected to God when I'm alone, because there's tourists everywhere. Tourists are milling around the place and so it means that I am able to be with people, but alone and in my own silent space with, um, with God. And yeah, it's, it, it's a strange thing saying extrovert because it doesn't necessarily mean that I've got my mouth open or that I'm actually interacting with people. It just means that there's people around. And, yeah. um, and lots of charismatics are not extroverts. I think it's a bit of a sort of, but this sort of assumption perhaps where we're coming from is that um if you're charismatic you can't be contemplative or reflective uh, and somehow the charismatic and the mystical are sometimes um put up as uh, in conflict with one another when i first started talking about this i started talking about this with ruth whilst we were going for our daily exercise as we were walking it's a two kilo kilo kilometer walk up the hill and round down past where the pub uh, is shut and um, I said I'm not sure I'm the right person to talk about um, being charismatic and being in isolation I'm not sure I have anything to say but for two kilometers I walked around talking about mysticism and the difference between mysticism and, um, and charismatic and whether they're actually the same thing and whether we're just sort of changing the language that we use uh, I think maybe a thousand years ago we would have talked about mystics and now we're talking about charismatics and we're talking about that interaction with god that is a very vivid experience but i don't think that i think they're both sort of describing a similar experience but in different ways you know mystics often were very solitary people whereas charismatic when you hear the word charismatic you think of a gathering like on fire where the room has somebody in every single seat and people standing up and singing and waving their arms in the air like that which is and that doing. whole idea of body ministry um which i you know i have lots of questions about but um you know the idea of everyone in a meeting contributing um it's based on 1 Corinthians and, and the, the problem is we, we're not quite sure if Paul is commending them for joining together and everyone contributing or whether he's complaining that when you gather together, everyone has to say something. 
um, because realistically in church, uh, you know, even a small, smaller church, um, if everyone had to say everything, at, something at every meeting, um, it might not work. Um, but the mystical tradition does, does sort of suggest that you might be on your own and have profound spiritual experiences. Um, and that's something that's always really appealed to me. Um, and I think the aspect of charismatic spirituality, which has always stuck with me as I've moved through different church styles of worship contexts has been that quite private encounter with God, um, which didn't involve anyone else laying hands on me or speaking some kind of prophetic word over me to use the kind of the, the language of the charismatic um the most profound spiritual experience i've ever had was in a church um having completed a watch on Monday thursday alone uh, in rural parishes uh, and that particular year nobody had joined um and after midnight um because that was quite late enough in a cold freezing rural church I uh, I was clearing up and uh yeah I had a profound mystical experience and, and a glimpse of Jesus and I just knew it was Jesus uh, and he was just there um and that's a very private experience I I guess I could have written a book about it and have a a, a show on God TV um <laughs> But it feels, you know, as much a mystical experience as a, as a charismatic experience. Wow. Uh, and if you'd have asked me at that time, if I was a charismatic, I'd have looked at you slightly askew and, and, and said, well, that's not a language that I want to use. Um, I think it's definitely interesting because I, until I've had this conversation with you, I haven't really thought about what my most charismatic experiences were. It's not I mean, a competition. You, yeah, yeah, I know. But uh, people who've regularly been to On Fire know where my space is at on fire i sit at the back with the tech gear and people often come up to me and say oh but you're missing out on this and you're missing out on that and you're missing out on the other and i say this is where i'm getting to do the thing that i love that i've given up to become the vicar and stand at the front and do this instead i am actually I, i'm sat with a, a recording uh, not a recording desk i'm sat with a, a mixing desk and a camera and microphones and um, you know, directing things, and, and I'm actually really engaging with something that I love about worship, but it isn't what people would think of as a traditional charismatic experience for somebody to be sat over at the side facilitating. Um, my profound experiences are in places where, like, like I say, sat by myself at the Ombre at uh, Durham Cathedral or in a Jesuit retreat house. Again, sat in front of an Ombre. I never really thought of myself as that kind of person, but when I'm when I'm now I'm thinking about the solitary experiences where I've met God most profoundly, I find it's actually contemplating the sacraments um, and and God stepping into our space and messing about with things. You know, I've, I've always thought about the sacramental experience as the point where God sticks his finger and stirs things around. And so, yeah, I think it's it's those points where I've probably had my most charismatic experiences. But this is definitely what would have been described by Julian of Norwich as, or maybe not described by her, but certainly when we think about her, as a mystical experience rather than a charismatic experience. Um, which makes me question the language we use as to whether it is just a different way of describing the same point of intimate contact and interaction with God, God's spirit with us. Because uh, I, I think that that's the other thing about my charismatic spirituality is, is um, you know, I, I have always struggled with the daily office. For me, it's something I do as a discipline. I've never found it particularly, I'm sure it does nourish me, just like potatoes. I'm not keen on potatoes either. Um, I'm sure it's good for me, but um, there's always been that sense of just resting in the presence of God, um, listening to a piece of music, not necessarily worship music, um, and and just lying there on your, my bed and just asking the Holy Spirit to come and meet with me. Mm. Um, and that's definitely a sort of uh, a locked in pandemic charismatic spirituality and comes back to the mystical again. 
It does. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned the Daily Office, because as soon as you started talking about Prime Ministry, the first thought in my head was, it's actually all exploding all over the place. There are people praying together at the Daily Office in ways that they never have. In my parish, I've got... Um, I've got conversations happening on the phone with people who were never connected to the internet before. So an 86 year old who's telling me that evening prayer, which we're doing through YouTube is vital for her because she's now praying the office with people. She was struggling with it and has been struggling with it for years, but now she's praying the office with people through the internet. And, and because the daily office is now becoming more widely known, people are requesting prayer. People who are the least likely people I would ever have thought of are suddenly sending me messages and asking for prayer about this, that and the other. And their neighbours, and suddenly they're caring about the people who are connected to them loosely. So it's my neighbour's friend. Could you pray for my neighbour's friend whose mum is? And it's suddenly this network of people praying is growing um, which I, I'm finding fascinating and I think it is a genuine renewal for some people that the office is becoming a, pl a place of nourishment again. It's a, a bizarre thing to, to think of this thing that we've often thought of as stayed and stilted as suddenly becoming the thing that is becoming such joy for people. There's something in the sacramental and the the ordered that rule of life stuff because mm -hmm. I I am a massive fan fan of rule of life. Even I mean, rule of life gets me excited in a way that just the office doesn't. You know, so I tend to think about the office as within my rule of life rather yeah. than 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 um, just the office because rule of life gets me really excited. Yeah. Um, but there's something deeply nourishing in that 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 the charismatic on its own doesn't always provide if it's divorced from that mm. that rootedness mm. yeah I and mean, it's interesting because um whilst we've been exploring this concept of the rule of life um which we've been doing now for two and a half three years since we started talking about building a community of vocation for young people in the parish um it started with we should be praying together it should be about praying the office together and we were working out what does that look like how do we make this work when people don't live close to church you can't find a time when people can be there at all the same time and then suddenly this lockdown has happened and we have found ourselves all praying the office at the same time um online together connected but disconnected um and and that root forming a rule of life what does it mean to to form a rule of life that is based around prayer but also based around other things like the study of the scriptures and so on and so forth um I, i'm talking to you you're the one who t talks to me more about rule of life than anybody else i know <laughs> and, and, and i'm going to be completely honest since i've had children in my life um that sense of rootedness and rule of life has actually suffered and struggled and that's where the charismatic grab 10 minutes quiet time with Jesus, read mm. some scripture, listen to a, a piece of music, a worship song that, that helps you enter God's presence. Um, that has absolutely come to the fore to kind of balance the, the, because if you have a, a disordered life, it's very hard to have a rule of life, and a lot of us do. I mentioned Julian of Norwich earlier on. She was an anchoress. Um, you know, the, the concept of being bricked into a room where you are a mystic and that is where you meet with God and it is all about being part of that rule of life um, that starts at the morning uh, and goes, in fact, it goes all through the night with the monastic officers and everything, you know, uh, the, the concept of being bricked in. I've got a, fo uh, a photo, I've got a, a painting, which I hope that they'll drop into this video of, of a bishop um, talking to an anchoress um, through, uh, praying with an anchoress through um, the, the gap in the wall in her anchorage. The idea of her being uh, a rooted anchor for the church who was praying constantly there um, with this um, rule of life based around 
constant prayer and I was thinking about that over the course of the last couple of days and then this evening as I realised that I had had a Zoom meeting um, with uh, one of the organisations that I'm a trustee for and the had my calendar up in front of me and I noticed that I've got a governor's meeting next week and then I started thinking when this lockdown finishes we might find that we are no longer able to do the things that we are now finding spiritually beneficial and we're extroverts what is that about the idea that I'm getting a sense of grief and loss over something that hasn't even happened yet that one day I'm going to have to give up praying the daily office at a certain time in the evening with my wife and we have to be there because YouTube summons us to do it because there are another 10, 15 people who join us through the power of the internet. And it's like, how am I feeling bereft at the idea that I'm going to be able to go out of the house and be summoned somewhere else and have to go to a meeting? That's, that's kind of weird. Um, it doesn't fit with my personality. <laughs> but, you know, we're all anchoresses now. We're all bricked in. <laughs> At the moment, thinking about lockdown, I've been having a few conversations with people about um, finance. As you know, my friends uh, <laughs> tend to be in the sphere of stewardship and uh, thinking about the, the concept of what happens in a lockdown where church is going to find itself financially um less well off inconvenienced financially inconvenienced yeah that's a good way of putting it um yeah. how are we going to deal with the financial situation indeed and, and the fear the fear is that that there are some places where you know there there are pots of money um but the the people decided to instantly try and protect those pots of money and so at the moment i'm finding myself having to say we might have to say to people that this needs to be challenged because we can't be a church that gives up on poor we can't be a church that gives up on the places on the edge we can't be a church that gives up on the vulnerable and that sort of prophetic thing is the sort of thing that makes you unpopular because when you turn around to somebody who has I'm, I'm making a church up now in my head okay. when you when you're talking about a church that has maybe half a million in the bank and co comparing it to a church that has nothing in the bank and is in a poor area and saying so to protect that half a million we're going to let the poor places just disappear out of existence and it's like oh man that's the that's and, my and understanding that's, of prophecy and, that, and it's frustrating because i don't want to be the guy that has to say it breaks my heart about the perception of the charismatic is that um the charismatic should be found in contextual church and ministry and local church and ministry um when jesus sent out the 72 he didn't say um find a convenient spot that's easily commutable for a, a range of people who might be interested in my message uh and get a big building and invest millions in it um yeah. because that's not church he said go and go to the town go where you're welcomed dwell with the person who welcomes you dwell in the place um and the charismatic absolutely has to call us to contextual ministry and contextual church um and being in the and being in a place and speaking to that place um and hearing what god is doing in the place there's a sense that sometimes the prophetic is kind of um and this is a simplification but you know if we tend to think of the evangelist as the person who goes out into the community and tells people all the wonderful things that god is doing um through the church come and hear the message come and hear the message um come to church because going to church is great we should we shouldn't hide that sometimes i think the prophet is the reversed evangelist who tells the church what god is doing out there in the world it's interesting because thinking about what a prophet is the week that we went into lockdown the reading was the dry bones and ezekiel and the people in exile it was um 
people who have been dragged from the place where they find God. It was the people no longer in Jerusalem and they felt bereft. Like so many people feel bereft about the closed church, um, not being able to meet as a community. And there in the midst of all of that is Ezekiel and speaking with the words of God and saying that the sinew was growing on these bones and they were raised up. And suddenly you find yourself in a place of genuine, mystical, charismatic, whatever you want to call it, engagement between God and prophet as God becomes viscerally real to Ezekiel in, a pe in, in the midst of a people who feel totally cut off from God. And that message of hope is there. <laughs> That message that something new is going to happen, that there is going to be a, 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 the raising up, the dry bones. And, you know, it's it's at this point where where I I find myself thinking about the wilderness experiences. So uh, uh, I know it's not the same thing. Jesus in the wilderness, you know, he went for 40 days and 40 nights to be tested. You know, it was about finding where that spiritual engagement was and being tested by the deceiver and being taken up to the highest tower and and those sorts of things it it's a lonely experience he's he's going out into the desert place he's going out into the wilderness on his own and and that's where i think as driven a by the spirit. people yeah uh, but as a christian people i think that that is actually oh now you've made me think eddie but as a Christian people, what if that is it, that we have been driven by the spirit into the wilderness to be tested so that we can become a greater church out of it? And because the scary thing is it, it was after his baptism. Yeah. Yes. And he was already in the wilderness to start with. <laughs> so, so he was already in the wilderness with John and then he gets driven further. Well. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah, it... but maybe this is the point where the church becomes the jewel in the crown. Maybe this is the point where we discover what it means to be the people of God when we are bricked up in our anchorages or driven into the wilderness, when we find our solitude, but also find community um, through the medium of talking to you via a mobile phone. <laughs> When we talk about gifts, you know, the, the, we talk about apostles, we talk about these things, but then we think about it without putting it in the context of Jesus sent people out, didn't gather people in, he sent people out. It is a yeah. deeply spiritual thing, you know, and it's not, it, it's not that it was written by one of the apostles that you should be sent out. It was Jesus sends people out, you know, God interaction with the disciples is that god in a profound moment sends them out and being in this space of of lockdown discovering or rediscovering the ability to be the solitary charismatic um might have huge missional and a missionary fruit we, we build church where we find ourselves and I and I've found that that for me is a, a, a hugely um, influential thing about how I view this lockdown. I don't find God in a particular place. I find God with the people I'm with and through prayer when I'm on my own. And so the idea that I have to go back to Holy Nativity to to meet with God, I don't find that a very Catholic thing. I find that a very later thing but i always hark back to the early church who were meeting in houses rather than the the post um we're still empire. 40 or 50 of them squeezing into rich people's houses i mean i mean yes but but <clears throat> for me parish isn't about the building and i love sacred space and i think there is sacred space and i love the fact that um in the building i worship in and lead worship in over there i am surrounded by the dead and, and all of that stuff is, is, is really important. But it's important because it's, it's a reflection of community and 
place in that broader yeah. sense that is relational. Um, a building should be relational. But yeah, it's it's that thing where where it's got um, a, a community that's lived in it and is living in it. Mm. And when people describe what they are missing about the worship, it is the community. They're describing how there's two little toddler girls who are missing dancing around to the songs and raising their arms in the air like this, like the vicar does when he does the Eucharistic prayer. They've never said the Eucharistic prayer, they're five now, but, but you know, standing there going, I'm doing what Rob's doing, that sort of thing, you know, learning to experience and play. And it, it's about them not being able to come and, and play whilst loving God and expressing that. It's about community rather than... And the way we groups. inhabit a space. It's the difference between house as architectural project mm. and home yeah. as live space. Charismatic faith is is faith to be in, in, inhabited, isn't it? It, it can't be. It, it it it's 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 just making a home, and um, you know, I I don't have the theology that some people have the Holy Spirit and some people don't have the Holy Spirit, and you get you know an extra second or third or however many blessings we're up to. Um, you know, we receive the Holy Spirit at baptism, and I've seen the Holy Spirit work in people who are not yet baptized. Uh, because it's up to God. Um, but there is this sense in the charismatic spirituality of this willingness for the Holy Spirit to continue to, to make home in us. Uh, and I think the Holy Spirit works in all Christians. And I think the spiritual gifts work in all Christians, whether they're charismatic or not, because that's what Paul said. He said, this is what makes the church all fit mm. together as a body. Um, so the charismatic is implicit it's there everywhere but as charismatics as there is this desire that we want to be home for the spirit and the spirit to to take our square boxes sometimes and, and mess with them mm. i'm really glad i'm a charismatic in a lockdown because you know your experience of the lockdown has been a blossoming of saying the office i have no one to say the office is with i have a toddler well not toddler she's four now but you know i have a child um mm -hmm. we we do say our little office together every night before bed we sing our songs and and, and say <laughs> our prayers um but it has to be there has to be this sense of this openness to the new and the experiencing god in ways in our very unique different experiences and contexts because mm. every household at the moment every lockdown household is a different context yeah. um you know you might be married to someone who i'm married to somebody who's um in a hospital every day mm -hmm. um with our other child you're married to someone who also is <laughs> In a hospital every day. If you're, if you're happy to say that, if not, they'll have to yeah. cut. You know, I, you know, that's different to to the families in church who are at home with their two teenage children, both trying to work mm -hmm. from home, um, whilst avoiding confidentiality issues of people overhearing each other's business meetings for different large, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. Different um, to the family who've been furloughed or lost their jobs and you know there, there's so many and and i think the flexibility of the charismatic is 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 there in that space mm. yeah I, I think that the most important thing about them um, being charismatic in a lockdown is discovering mysticism and prayer as a as a real gift to not just the church but to wider society um i think that people uh, are longing for the church to be there to pray for people and pray with people and and i think that um that is the gift that we are rediscovering as a as a church um and i know that there are plenty of people who've been out there doing the daily office morning noon and night in their churches in tiny groups or or whatever but um, I, th I think now that it is becoming something which is bigger than ever before, um, I think that it is 
the, the real gift that we're discovering as a church. Um, and I hope that this is a point where we are going to find renewal. We're going to discover what is important and we're going to, um, uh, uh, hopefully, we will then um, build upon what we have learned through this when we come out the other side. I think that that is the most important thing. I think that, that we're going to learn something about being Christians and we're going to learn something about who God is and what our calling is as Christians through this. I think we're going to grow deeper with God through being locked in our anchorages or off in the wilderness. Seeing as I'm mixing two metaphors together, why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's always the way with the prophet. They always mix their metaphors. <laughs> Be blessed. Indeed. Right. Stop recording. Stop recording. Hello, my name is Monica Bolly and I am the trustee and treasurer of On Fire Mission. I hope you're keeping safe and well in these really difficult times. Many organisations have taken a financial hit in the current circumstances and On Fire Mission is no exception. And so I'd like to encourage you to give a donation to the ongoing work of On Fire Mission if you are in a position to do so. Many have attested to the joyful and enriching experience that our annual conference is, and indeed the other events that we lay on, and we also like to be able to fund those who otherwise would not be able to attend. And so if you are able to donate, please send an email to info at onfiremission, that's one word, dot org. That's info at onfiremission.org. And you'll be sent information on where to pay your donation and also a gift aid form. Thank you. And thank you also to those of you who have already sent us a donation.
Hi there and welcome to our worship this evening. As we begin, let's take a moment to still our hearts and to enter into God's presence. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. certainly have worth and we know that at the heart of all that we do Jesus remains the constant at the center when the music fades all is stripped away and I simply just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within
a time when it's so easy to feel overwhelmed. The future seems so uncertain. It's a time when all we can do is turn to God, to look to Him, for Him to give us that vision that we so desperately need. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do.
Thank you for joining us for OFM Online. It's been great to have you with us. Join us again tomorrow from 7pm when we'll be exploring the question of what a sacramental spirituality might look like at home. But for now, why not grab a drink and head over to the Zoom bar, which will be open from 8 till 9.30pm. The link is on our Facebook page. And keep the conversation going on social media too, using hashtag OFM online and hashtag sacramental spirit filled. Thanks for joining us. Bye.